This is the center of North America, Manitoba, with its progressive towns and cities. I was really amazed, actually, when I think back on it now, because we were just a couple of kids. I was 19 and he was 22, I think, something like that. And you, and you go up there from living in the city and to this really strange place where, where we were expected to survive and live and all that kind of stuff. Just how well I did adapt to it. When I first got up there and, and on the corner in that square was Hudson Bay Company. As a city girl from Victoria, walking into that was like stepping into a movie where the trading post, you know, like with the Hudson Bay blankets on the wall and the snowshoes. It was like stepping into another world. Maybe coming from Winnipeg and not really being used to it like right away, but I remember I loved it. I just, I fell in love with the country food and there was stuff there that uh, my other brothers and sisters wouldn't eat, like some of the intestines and the guts and that kind of stuff. And I used to watch mom eat it and I said, hey, let me try some. And I remember I just loved it. The best, my favorite was a caribou stomach. It's a, called Kistavak. It's the caribou stomach, and you wrap it up with uh, uh, the fat, like, you know, the fat that's around the stomach. And you roll that up into a ball, and you freeze it, and you just eat it half frozen, eh, and it's like icicles in it. To me, it was just like ice cream. <laughs> And what's this? A deep sea port in the heart of the North American continent? In Manitoba, nothing surprises. In this province, where abundance flows from every corner, why not Churchill? Our very own deep sea private port. Another Manitoba abundance. Living up north. Well, it was different, I guess, for me at first. But then, uh, when we, uh, when I know I had to live up there, <laughs> see that that's a choice I took. Because I know when I first went up north, I didn't know a thing about even. Johnny says, "Oh, he, he learned me how to make tea." <laughs> he said, "I didn't even know how to make tea." <laughs> <laughs> I'm the resource teacher and I look after K-12 to and any special needs that are in our school and, and now I've been here for nine years. I said I would stay five and I, I don't know what it is about this community or something about it that just keeps you here. So anyway, so we came for a year. Well, I'm going to stay another year, and another one, and, not, and now going 56 years, eh? Well, off and on, I said, we'd go back and forth. We had come to the Paul for a while, go back up there, because the work was always available there, eh? Whereas in the Paul, was not, wasn't always, uh, wasn't always jobs there to get. But Churchill, you could always get a job there. And that's what the attraction was. But I think it's because it's um, it's not just a job, it's a whole community thing. You're looking after your own people, you know, and you're, it's sort of like an investment in um, the next generation or something like that. Either that or I'm crazy. <laughs> a lot of older people who had left Churchill came back and kind of disappointed in what the town looks like now. Mind you, it's a very nice, it's very nice what the town did, but they did it for tours to make Churchill look nice. The whole town and the Fort Churchill just kind of disappeared the way it was. And then right before my eyes, and sometimes I stop and think about it. 
I always like living church in Churchill. There's a bear over there somewhere. Could you stop the camera? Oh, about that plane again, yeah. yeah. No, I'd never, did that you was, I'd never, never hear about it? No? No, not really. I was, we had moved down from the north in 1953, and this, when did this plane incident take place? It's about 55. the 55. So I would have been about 11 or 12, so I really had no recollection no. of that either, you know? And I think the Army, too, the, uh, the Americans they used to keep everything to themselves anyways. Yeah. They won't uh, spread, you know, stuff. <laughs> when I was telling my kids, they said, oh, is that the Miss Piggy? <laughs> you know that plane that's up there? <laughs> and that other big old, what they call it, the old, <laughs> that, that old plane laying up on the wall there? I see that thing take off that day. Uh, Miss Piggy, I don't know it, uh, where they got that name from, but anyway, it was a nickname they painted on the side of the airplane. I remember when that crashed. It's no wonder that everybody came out of there alive. <laughs> it was a cargo plane. It was a C-46 freighter. We had we operated three of them. Uh, Lamb Air did, but the C-46 was a great airplane. It would, uh, you could haul uh, 18,000 pounds in it. But it went uh, flew 180 miles an hour. So it was a great, it was a great freighter. And I, I watched it take off and I heard it groan and moan and, and it went out and I said, that goddamn thing is gonna blow up as sure as hell. And uh, he just got out a few, maybe 25 miles or so out and uh, one engine starting to act up. So the pilot turned around, came back to Churchill. And then it had just been overloaded with too much was too heavy to be flying. Maybe they overloaded, maybe they didn't. Nobody knows. I don't know what happened, but I think it turned around and came back. And it kind of hit the wires while it was coming down. Thank God they cut those uh, wires there. They, they were not hot anyways. But it's the last thing that they pulled about four poles down along the bay. <laughs> and then boom, into the rocks. Very fortunate, it didn't, uh, nobody got hurt. They just undid their seat belts and walked us out. But uh, it was in uh, the fall, I think it was November, and getting cold and we had a load of soft drinks on, pop like the, the uh, staples to the north. There's uh, pop, uh, pampers, and potato chips. Those are the three staples of the north. So it hit the rocks, and I phoned the RCMP. We wanted to, I phoned Mark Ingebrigtsen at Churchill to get the pop off because it was going to freeze. And then, you know, there was 10,000 pounds of pop on board. And uh, so the Mountie said, no, don't touch it, don't touch it. It was an accident scene, so, of course, we it couldn't touch it. And then after it was all nice and frozen, the phone's up and says, okay, go ahead, and you can move. <laughs> it's after the fact. It's been damaged quite a bit. We try to tell people the... You know, leave it, it's nice to look at it. People just go there and wrap things. Well, the, yeah, the environmental people at the time, they weren't as stringent as they are now. Of course, they were all after us to get that thing out of there, and it, uh, just things got delayed and delayed, and then it ended up that it was, uh, it was an asset to the community, so just leave it alone, you know? So that's where it is. So anyway, this is not the first time anybody interview. I'm, uh, I'm a TV star to, uh, to, to begin with. Anyway, no, no, I'm not joking. You, the, 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 this is true. Now I don't want to wake up and have a big bear alongside of me. Eh? See those steps here? I was inside the cabin. A bear who wasn't welcome. So I heard the noise outside. So I grabbed a gun. Only the socks on, on my feet, I went on those nails, all the way down. Yes, that's what happened, so I was hospital. But I find out it's work anyway. <laughs> yeah.
Well, that is a, a, a cargo plane. Uh, I imagine, I'm never sure that was for, they fly for uh, Do Line, you see. And uh, how it happened, they ran out of fuel that they uh, landed on the bay. That particular DC-4 was flying back and forth. I, I really don't know who owned it. I think it was an American company. And uh, they wanted to get it into into Churchill, uh, but it was they couldn't fix it up to fly it up. But um, it was it was working on the dew line uh, so, supply. And the dew line was just being built in those days, 54, 55, 56, and 57. Churchill, of course, was the main staging point for the central do line and uh, there was a lot of uh, everything had to be flown up there and it was just the do line went ran along uh, just north of repulse bay which is the arctic circle starting at the northernmost tip of alaska it would stretch 3,000 miles across the continent to baffin island opposite greenland distant early warning line they named it do line it became but yeah, like back in the 50s, 60s, the dew line was a, was a big thing. Uh, well, it was the only defense that we had, I guess, uh, in the Cold War. What was once the impassable Arctic now provides the quickest routes for attack from a wide sector of Europe and Asia. Like everybody up north like, knew about the dew line. We knew about it, but not that much other than people coming into town that are on their way up into the new line and out and they end up staying here at the hotels. And I know that we, we'd see them go out with their toboggans and that. And they'd be gone for days. They, yeah, they learned how to survive in the cold. And that was something for a lot of those Americans. They'd come from down south and it was tough on them, I'm sure. You know, you couldn't just one day you'd be popped in and uh, and, uh, and learn how to survive. Like this new program they got there, the Survivor Man, where he gets dropped off here and there and survives for a week or whatever. Uh, fine and dandy, like for a show, but like if he got dropped off middle of nowhere and nobody was gonna come pick him up in a week, where, where would he be in a month? <laughs> I mean, these guys couldn't have survived. If they went out on the land up in the North Country, there's shit, they'd be dead. And you know, 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> 